Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey everybody, this is the Digital Asset Investor and I'll, what you're looking at are the return rates on Coin Paprika because I wanted to show you something. Bitcoin of course gets all the headlines and it's got a 821% return on the year. But the crazy thing, I've shown you this before, XRP's get up 218% with an SEC lawsuit. Look down here at Stellar. Stellar actually has a higher return than Bitcoin with all of the free press and all of the media and all the traditional, all of the media that is owned by the traditional financial sector in Wall Street, with all of that, Bitcoin still can't get better gains than the better technology, which is stellar. Now, I also wanted to show you this, if I can find the one I wanted to show you here. Here we go, right here, Filecoin. This is up 4,780% on the year. I want to show you a tweet I saw today, not this one. Uh, I actually got it out of place here, right here. This is John Deaton. He's the guy that's filing the class action lawsuit against the SEC. He says, I didn't know anything about Filecoin when I learned that Greg Kidd invested in it. I bought in at $32. I bought Filecoin using money I could afford to lose solely on the basis that Greg Kidd is smarter than me. I don't recommend my I'm an idiot, but that that guy isn't approach. But uh, anyway, so the bottom line is this. I did the exact same thing that John Deaton did. I've told you on this channel, look, Guys like Greg Kidd that I've studied and I know they just always seem to pick, make the right picks. Um, to me, that's a, that's a good strategy for those of us like me that, that, that we're just looking for. We're looking for anyone who might know something that we don't. And even though we don't know guys like this that well or anything, we can. You, I, I would say it's a safer bet than a lot of things I've invested in in my life. <laughs> to put it beside guys like that, anyway. Um, I thought that was an interesting tweet because I did the exact same thing. Stuart Eldorati, who's Ripple's general counsel, wrote this today. I'll reserve judgment on the merits of the library case till I know the facts. But one fact is abundantly clear. Regulatory uncertainty, er, uncertainty deliberately created and maintained by Clayton's SEC, exactly, continues to be weaponized against the industry. Who is next? And he's retweeting this uh, from the library uh, lawsuit. Library is fighting to save crypto. Help us save crypto. And as you go down, he also said this, oh, and all this is happening while the revolving door of Clayton's SEC spins at a dizzying rate. Exactly right. You can tell these guys are frustrated with what Jay Clayton has done as they should be. Now, Mr. BXRP sent me this this morning. And I wanted to show this to you because I am a child of, well, I'm a child of the dot-com boom and bust. I'm a child of, of um, the 2008 financial crisis. Both of those things have shaped who I am as far as finance goes. They've shaped how I react to things. The, as I've told you a thousand times on this channel, the 2008 financial crisis has everything to do with digital assets. I want you to watch this from the two-minute mark. This is pretty shocking and it should shock you. Watch closely because this is going to affect all of your lives for the next two or two to five years. Now we can understand them, that's why. And it makes us feel smart, okay? Okay, so inventory. Here's the graph. It goes back all the way to 2006, which predates the last once in a lifetime economic downturn. Now, that's a very important point a once in a lifetime economic downturn that we saw in 2008. Okay, so let's go through this and follow us because this is really important. The dark, dark blue on the top of each column represents loan modifications. In fact, if you look at the spike in 2010, that would be the loan modifications from the 2008 housing meltdown. It's always a lagging indicator. And as you can see, the spike in these columns are fairly pronounced next to the years right before 
and right after 2010. Now the blue right beneath the dark, dark blue in the columns represents repayment plans. These would be repayment plans on loans that had been put into forbearance. Now it's worth noting of the four options presented on this graph, only repayment plans and loan modifications, the two we discussed, would be deemed good options. It's also worth pointing out that the two good options represent the least amount of activity in any of the columns. So let's keep going. Trickling down, the lighter blue below that represents loans that are currently in forbearance. That means, as we know, if we break it down, folks that are simply not making their house payments. And below that, in the lightest blue, are payment deferrals. That's also folks not making their payments. Okay, too good, the two darkest blue, and too bad, the two lighter blues. Got it? And this goes all the way back to 2008. Okay, so now where is your inventory going to be coming from? I'd like you to look at the very far right of this graph. Shocking. That's your inventory. Now, this is nothing short of remarkable. I mean, it's shocking. Seriously. There's no other, how there is no other word for what you're looking at right there than pure shocking. Higher our non-payment loans are now relative to any year since 2006. The number of non-payments, it's literally off the chart. We have to put this in perspective because we are fishing for minnows off the back of a whale, guys. This is huge, and it is, as Frank Look, said, shocking. This is 2010. So here's the thing that we need to... All right, I think you get the picture. That is literally shocking. And don't you think for a minute that that doesn't affect all parts of the financial system. And I believe that they planned for this because I believe that they knew this day would come. I believe that they knew that the papering over of our economy that the Fed has done and all the different central banks of the world, they've done nothing but printed and QE'd to infinity. And they knew that they were just stalling this day. And you, yeah, that, they'll blame it on they'll blame it on the current events, the you know the little uh, pandemic we've had. They'll blame it on that. But all they did over the course of the last ten years is set us up, and it just so happens that a, a pandemic is what is going to trigger this one. But it, something else would have triggered it because what they were doing was never sustainable, and everybody knows it. Now, I wanted to show you this unpopular opinion. It's actually just the truth. Ethereum could be in trouble. Yeah, sure. It'll keep pumping and make a lot of people a lot of money. That's because the media is pumping it. But I truly believe that VeChain, Polkadot, Cardano, Cosmos, and even Flare, actually that he should have they should have put Flare on the front end of that. Very tough competition. Ethereum has not had to compete because the media has run with that name just like they ran with Bitcoin. I believe that's also part of a plan. I believe there will be a day sooner rather than later that that whole narrative is intentionally shifted. And I believe when that happens, and I think that I, I even think I can even tell you why, how I think it's going to happen. I think this is going to be a tax issue. I think the proof of work digital assets are going to be reined in by, by taxes. All this climate talk you see, all this net zero carbon emissions talk, all of this is a plan. And I believe that they've always known that that's how they're going to rein Bitcoin in. I believe that's the reason these regulators have done nothing, because they knew that when the time comes and enough money, think about this for a minute, they have let all of this money flow into these proof of work digital assets that they know are not going to change the financial system because they can't, they can't scale, they know it. But they've let the money flow there and you have to ask yourself the question why. I believe the answer to that question is that the way they always planned that they would control it is the one way that would benefit the governments of the world. Let the money flow into it. Let the money flow into these lesser technologies. And then when the time is right, you tax it. You say, oh, well, this, these are not climate friendly, so we're going to have to impose an um, emission tax or a climate tax or an energy ta tax, whatever they want to call it. And they're going to tax these proof of work digital assets and that's how they're going to rein them in because you need to ask yourself this question and this is just a purely a hypothetical this is me talking out loud let's say you own a sixty thousand dollar bitcoin and over here is a sixty thousand dollar whatever coin i'm not even going to use any particular coin but the other coin does not use a lot of energy think about the world we live in now the other coin does not use a lot of energy to, for mining and all that. The other coin doesn't even use mining, but Bitcoin does. What these people are gonna do, I'm telling you, write it down. 
they're going to say, well, these proof of work coins, we're going to have to impose a climate tax on this digital asset. That's how they're going to get you. So the question you need to ask yourself is, if you've got a $60,000 Bitcoin versus a $60,000 other digital asset, and they put a huge tax on Bitcoin, now they got you. And I think that's been the plan all along. It was a tax. It was always going to be taxes. Steve, Steve Gobronson, he sent me this. Oakland A's say they plan to hodl Bitcoin. Will use gains to sign free agents. I'm sure they will. And then there's this. Good old Goldman Sachs. The white shoe boys are here to save the day. Breaking Goldman Sachs will be offering Bitcoin. And this is from CNBC, who had it wrong all along. Uh, breaking news. Coming from CNBC.com, banking reporter Hugh Sun, Goldman Sachs is getting close to offering Bitcoin investment products to its wealthy clients. Hugh Sun joins us now. Um, does Goldman know Bitcoin was like four thousand bucks like eighteen months ago, and now it's like fifty-seven thousand? There, this is part of their uh, their expertise. Hugh. <laughs> well, Joe, I think the. Uh those dizzying charts that everybody has uh, is looking at and salivating over. That's one of the reasons why uh, uh, Goldman and others are, are getting into this. You know, they are in a client business. So when clients of Goldman Sachs or clients of Morgan Stanley, you know, call up their financial advisor and say, should I have an allocation to Bitcoin? Look, look at what it's done. You know, should I have a 1%, 2%, 3% allocation to this emerging asset class? You know, they've had to say, well, as, as a firm, we can't really recommend that. Well, that changes, and that changes very, very soon. So as we report exclusively on uh, CBC.com, Goldman Sachs is, is very close, and in the second quarter, will begin offering Bitcoin and other digital asset-related investments to its private wealth management clients. This is, the, uh, this is sort of the Tony private bank of Goldman Sachs. You know, they really target people and endowments with at least $25 million in, in assets under management. Okay. Let me show you what Goldman Sachs was saying back in 2018, because I remember it. Back in the darkest days of the, the bear market for crypto, Goldman Sachs was doing all of their misdirection. This is from um, August 3rd of 2018. Goldman Sachs, Bitcoin is never coming back. And I will bet you a dollar to a donut that while they wrote, had this article written, that they were buying it in the over-the-counter market. This is how these guys operate. So if you see them talking about how they're coming into Bitcoin now, watch out for your wallets because I can promise you, I'm going to show you, well, I'll go ahead and show you now. This is the kind of stuff you need to be watching out for. It says, Justin, asset manager BlackRock held $360,000 in CME Bitcoin futures markets earlier this year. New SEC filing show. When I saw this, I immediately remembered what Christian Carlos said in 2017. It was a Coindesk article. The article may have been later than that. But he was talking about how in 2017 that he was instructed by the Trump administration to go and create futures in Bitcoin and that they needed to, what he called, bring discipline to the market. When you hear bring discipline to the market and it's a government official, that means they want to control the market. They don't give a rat's behind about discipline for you. That doesn't factor into this at all. When they say bring discipline, that means that the people, the Goldman and the boys, all the guys that are running the world and running the financial world are trying to to stack the odds in their favor. You write that, write it down, stamp it on your forehead if you have to. Okay, now Mike Novogratz is weighing in now, and he says that the baby boomers are, the, are about to jump into crypto. And I'll read a couple of quotes from him. He says, it could be as, as much as trillions, trillion dollars comes over the next year from giant, a giant group of wealth, says Novogratz, who used to run a hedge fund for investment uh, fortress, okay? The money will start coming in early next month. And this article is from the last few days. Money will start coming in early next month. He said of Wall Street, Wall Street banks move. And then the final thing he said, he said, if you're worried that the U.S. is printing too many dollars, you're going to shift some of your savings into Bitcoin. Now, I'm moving along. Here's Mike Novogratz right here. He was on CNBC today, I guess. Mike, in, in terms of valuation on Bitcoin at this point, do you have any kind of more, I mean, at some point, if big banks are getting involved in this, you want to be able to have some kind of quote unquote fundamental analysis of, of what it could be worth. 
And I think you're, you're absolutely right. The blockchain, you're starting to see the value, even in the context of NFTs, and I know there's debates about that, but the idea that you could attach it, attach a non-fungible token to a song, for example, and the artist could get could get paid, and we had Steve Stout on uh, earlier uh, in the show talking about that kind of thing. That makes a lot of sense to me. The question is whether, you know, what the ultimate value of a Bitcoin could be if you don't think it becomes a currency. You just mentioned you think it, I, I, I'm not sure, are you, are you, are you now? I don't uh, think it's a currency. I think the currency is a digital place? asset. It's gold. And the way I keep, you know, at the beginning of the year, I thought. Six He's saying that because he knows it can't be anything else. 60,000 was my target because that would have been 10% of gold. But I told myself and, and our listeners, our investors, that once it gets to 10%, we're all going to say it's going to 20%. And then when it gets to 20, it's going to go to 50 and then to 100. I do think Bitcoin is on an inevitable path to have the same market cap and then a higher market cap as gold. And so it's just how fast adoption happens. Adoption is happening faster than I pre had predicted. Uh, it's shocking to me how fast people are moving into the system and how short people are, right? Because once you decide it's an asset class, if you're not long, you're short. And most people don't have Bitcoin in their portfolios yet. And they want to at least... So uh, he so, so he is... Um, now remember, you, you can't forget, he's Goldman Sachs. And, and so that's an, that's an ex extremely important part of this. He's one of the, the white shoe boys that I just told you about. Jonathan D. sent me this. Now, this is from Leonidas. This hasn't been announced yet, so I guess I'll let the cat out of the bag. SBI CEO Yoshitaka Katao replaced by BRD Wallet CEO, co-founder and SBI Ripple Asia CEO. And if you look at this, this guy is one of the most impressive guys that I've seen in blockchain, this Adam Trademan. And I remember him telling the story, he was in a Thinking Crypto video where he was talking about Yoshitaka Katao wanted him to be the CEO of SBI Ripple Asia. And he said that, that um, he was like, well, I can't do that. I'm the CEO of BRD. And then he said, Yoshitaka said, well, I'm the C I, I'm, I'm on the boards of all these companies and, and you, you're telling me you can't do just two. And so anyway, that's how he, he became. So anyway, I think Yoshi, I think he's become one of, Yoshitaka Katao's point men, and so I think that that's what, what that was about. Okay, uh, finally, I wanted to show you this from Christine Lagarde. She said, talking about ECB could have a digital currency within four years, watch this. And the decision as to whether or not we will move with the digital euro will be taken by that organ, the governing council. Uh, it will so decide. And that will be mid-21. Uh, Okay, so we, in terms of what are the deliverables now, we will soon be releasing uh, the analysis of the 8,000 responses that we got from the consultation process. That will be communicated uh, to the European Parliament, which is one of the key uh, players, as well as the Commission and the Council with which we operate, not to mention the Eurogroup. Then after that, mid-21, uh, the Governing Council, on the basis of that consultation and the preliminary, preliminary work that we are doing, will decide whether we go ahead with experimenting. And then there will be a second decision, probably, you know, a year from, I don't know whether it will be a six months uh, first uh, assessment or one year assessment, whether we actually uh, are going to roll out. But the whole process, let's, let's you know, not be... Um, let's be realistic about it, will, in my view, take another four years, maybe a little more, but I, I would hope that we can keep it within four years, because it's, it's, a, it's a technical endeavor, as well as a fundamental change. Okay. Um, oh, they're doing it. I wanted to bring to your attention, this, this week, and this is in the description of all my videos, and they're a sponsor, link to, this week, they added Ripple shares and they sold out. I mean, I think it was within less than a day. Then they added Uphold shares like two or three times. They all sold out. And now they added Uphold shares back and the price has gone up to $6.75. But now they have a bunch of, uh, I think it's a good many Uphold share, or at least they were early in the day. I don't know where it's at now. But go check it out if, 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 if you're um, an accredited investor or it's something you want to look into. I do it. I've got, I've bought a lot of uphold. Um, at, they're called SPVs, but it's private equity. I bought a lot of them myself. I'm the digital asset investor. I'm not an investment advisor. This is for entertainment purposes only. Please subscribe, hit the like button, and tell your friends and family.
But there is a uphold private equity on link to if it's.